Hello, listeners. Today is Wednesday, March 20th. Welcome to Behind the Numbers, Reimagining Retail, an eMarketer podcast. This is the show where we talk about how retail collides with every part of our lives. I'm your host, Sarah Lebo. Today's episode topic is a very special episode. We are discussing what happened at Shop Talk. Let's meet today's guests. Joining me for today's episode, we have Chief Content Officer at eMarketer, Zia Daniel Wigner. Hey, Zia, welcome to the podcast. Good morning, Sarah. We haven't had you in a bit. Happy to have you. No, it's been a while. Also with us, someone else who hasn't been on for like a little bit, Principal Analyst Jasmine Enberg. Welcome back, Jasmine. Thanks for having me, Sarah, and hi, everyone. Okay, let's get started with free sample. Our Did You Know segment, where I share a fun fact, tidbit, or question. I'm quizzing you guys. I didn't tell you guys I was going to quiz you, but I am. For today's question, we're heading to the International House of Pancakes. IHOP started doing a special Pancake of the Month flavor for each month. March's was based off of a popular Girl Scout cookie flavor. Can you guys guess what the March Pancake of the Month flavor is? Is it mint? I was going to guess mint for St. Patrick's Day. Well, it's Girl Scout cookie, so. Thin mint. Thin mint. Yes, exactly. There we go. <laughs> it, All it right, is Jasmine thin for mint. the win. Um, yeah, February was chocolate strawberry. I don't think they had one in January. Um, and March is thin mint. Would you guys try thin mint pancakes? Yeah, I actually, I love Thin Mints and I just bought some. I think it was, well, it was last month because um, it was the Super Bowl and it was from the most entrepreneurial Girl Scouts <laughs> I've ever seen. They were outside of the supermarket on Super Bowl Sunday, bright and early in the morning, selling Girl Scout cookies, yelling out that they took any form of payment and they had a little wow. square machine. They took cash. It was fantastic. And I had to buy some. So yes, That's, I would definitely try um, Thin Mint Pancakes. Yeah, they sound actually surprisingly good. I can imagine with whipped cream or something on top, that would be a tasty way to start your day. Yeah, I was. I think it would be a tasty way to maybe end your day. That too. I don't know if yeah. they're they're the most start your day. I'm a savory breakfast person, so I'm biased. But yeah. I would definitely try a Thin Mint Pancake. Okay, now it's time for our next segment. From the shop floor, where we discuss the best bits from an event. Today, we're talking about Shop Talk. Jasmine and Zia have spent the last few days at the show in Vegas. I sent them on a scavenger hunt and told them to report back. So let's get started. So the first thing I asked you guys was what standout takeaway was from a session. Zia, why don't you go first with this? Sure. So I'm going to have to start with Jasmine's session because Mm. there were lots of great takeaways from hers. But I think one of the most important ones was a topic she started out with in which she showed headlines from a couple different media publications talking about the fact that everyone sort of had jumped to the conclusions that social shopping was not going to be a thing because there had been a handful of different initiatives that maybe didn't work out the way they had initially planned. And so many people had written it off, whereas in fact, the truth was anything but that. And there is a very bright future for it ahead, which she then dove into during the course of her conversation. But this whole idea that it's just not going to happen, I think, is a myth that refuses to die. Yeah, I think that like it's not going to happen maybe in the way people thought it would like five or 10 years ago, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening. Or in the way that the social platforms thought it would, especially Meta, right? You know, many of those initiatives were rolled back for very real reasons that had to do with their own business and had nothing to do with whether or not we were shopping and buying on the platform. Just wasn't happening the way they wanted it to. Yeah. And I think just it's inevitable that that inspiration and transaction piece are going to move closer together. And to your point, Jasmine, it just may look quite different than what was originally anticipated. Yeah. I just saw that Meta announced in like Instagram ads that they're incorporating discount codes like into the ads themselves really shows that they're pushing people to purchase like then and there and have a sense of urgency. So I don't see it going anywhere. Jasmine, what is a standout takeaway from a session that you saw? So my takeaway is actually from the session that was just before mine. It was from McKinsey, and they were talking about consumer sentiment. And there was a lot of great pieces of information in there. But the most interesting finding for me was about Gen Z, because they showed that there was this duality in their behavior. So one thing they talked about is how Gen Z is saving, but they're also the most likely to splurge across generations. So it's that treat yourself mentality that's very real with them. And that reflects a lot of what we see in our 
research here at eMarketer. So things like Gen Z being really worried about sustainability, but then they'll go and buy from fast fashion brands like Shein and Teemu. And they're also the most digital generation, Gen Alpha excluded, but you can also find them in stores. And a lot of that omni-channel behavior is also something that's come up in a lot of the conversations that I've had here this week. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, Gen Z has parents that they see maybe like drowning in student debt. They don't want to get into that debt. But at the same time, they've had all of these things happen. They've had COVID. They have this sort of like YOLO mentality where you still have the sense to splurge. YOLO mentality is actually the scientific research term for that. I was going to say, though, isn't YOLO a <laughs> millennial term? Oh, yeah, but I'm a millennial, so <laughs> same. <that's> fine. <laughs> Sky says that sometimes. Um, and so that's what I was thinking is she's like, they're feeling YOLO. Okay, continuing on, what is an interesting side conversation that you've had at Shop Talks? Jasmine, you take this one first. Sure. I've had a lot of great conversations, but one that really stood out to me was with Influential, which is a big influencer marketing firm and free people. And we spoke a lot about the collapsing of entertainment and creators and how the lines are blurring there. And the Super Bowl ads, of course, were a really great example of this, where you had traditional celebrities and creators like in the Duncan ad, which featured Charlie D'Amelio and Ben Affleck. But we're also seeing other brands do that as well. So Free People had a great example of when you know they activated Bihari Prinsloo for a campaign, but then they also activated a lot of influencers and creators across social media. And then we also talked about, again, this trend toward omni-channel behavior and how creators are playing a big role in that. So Influential has done a lot of work in digital out of home with creators, for example. But like the Duncan ad shows, we're also seeing creators now show up in all sorts of different media channels, including traditional ones like TV. Yeah, that makes sense. One of my favorite Super Bowl ads was the Nerds Addison Ray one, which mm-hmm. was definitely creator focused. Although I mainly liked it for the little nerd guy that was in it. <laughs> But yeah, I think that we definitely see that creators wanting to make the jump into traditional and also like traditional celebrities doing things that they maybe wouldn't have considered doing 10 years ago, like video games. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something I wrote about last year during the dual Hollywood strikes, um, really Mm -hmm. talking about how creators are trying to branch off of social media or really are branching off of social media and celebrities are taking a page out of creators books and really behaving like creators whether it's on social or you know doing other things as you mentioned yeah something i'm definitely watching there is uh if mr beast actually ends up creating content with amazon zia what is an interesting side conversation that you had Sure. I've actually had a bunch of different interesting ones, but the one I'm going to highlight is quite different than the one Jasmine had. And this was with one of the speakers last night as we were walking to a reception and he's looked at the retail space for a very long time. So I was asking him, like, what do you learn when you come to these events? Do you learn from the presentations on stage, the keynotes, the side conversations? And he said, I actually learned most from the side conversations, but not necessarily in the way you might think. For me, what I'm listening for are sort of those subtle cues around what's happening. So he said, for example, last year, a lot of people were saying, oh, I'm leaving a day early because I don't want to spend on an extra night at the hotel, Mm. or I connected getting here because I wanted to save a few hundred dollars. And he said those subtle cues are what gives him an indication of what's happening more broadly in the economy and how companies are thinking about spending. So it's not necessarily something overt that he takes away, but rather those inferences from conversations around consumer sentiment and spending. Did he see a change from this year to last year? Yes. Yeah. He said last year there was quite a lot of conservative spending on the event. Companies and the individuals here were looking to you know, save those extra dollars in a way that he hadn't heard as much this year. Okay, interesting. And then this just happened last night, so you haven't really had a chance to implement the strategy, but have you picked up on similar sentiments in your side conversations? I have not. I've not heard anyone that was planning to leave early due to budget constraints, or at least not that they shared. I would say that events certainly are you know, back in full force, and you've got a lot of people here this year, a lot of folks that are spending the whole time at the event and made sure that they were arriving in plenty of time to consume the content. Yeah, I feel like my biggest motivation for leaving early is usually trying to avoid that West Coast to East Coast red eye, and I never do. I always end up on it. Four o'clock, Sarah. You got to get the flight by four o'clock I, to make I, it back to the East Coast. But then the you have to day. leave the event at like 
two something, maybe earlier, but you're right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about booths? Were you guys on the floor at all looking at booths? Did you see anything interesting there? So maybe I'll jump in and take this one. And I'm going to quasi answer that question. I'm not going to highlight one booth, but rather, again, another meeting I had, I was sitting with someone who runs a major retail media network. And he was saying that he was amazed by just the volume of companies or sponsors that are now targeting that space. Mm. He was like, you know, when I go and I walk the floor, it is just, you know, everyone looking to sell me some component of a retail media platform. And that's quite different than in past years that component of Shop Talk has only grown over the years. And so I thought that was an interesting piece of commentary on the sponsors that you're seeing at the event. Yeah. I mean, Google just announced that they're getting into retail media. So we're definitely seeing this for those of us not at Shop Talk as well. Yeah. And I can talk about a specific booth. TikTok, again, had a big booth right smack in the middle of the show floor. And one of the things that was really interesting that they did this year was they had a quiz that you could take. And if you took it, you could win a bunch of cool swag. And the questions really were surrounding TikTok shop and how it's doing and how it's performing. And the best part, of course, was you didn't have to get all the questions right in order to win. And I sat down there for a couple of conversations with some executives. There was a lot of great learnings and findings that we had. But And Marcus will appreciate this, but during the show, TikTok also announced a new ad format, which places ads right in the marketplace or in the shop tab. And so these ads start to show up when people are searching for specific products, very similar to how ads show up on Amazon. And that is another prediction of mine that has come true in March of 2024. In our report, I predicted that TikTok would go much more heavily into search advertising this year and infringe more on Amazon's turf. And this is a clear signal of that. And TikTok search advertising, it's not retail media, but it's operating in the same way. It's an advertisement that's in search. That's what Amazon is doing in retail media. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, TikTok with TikTok shop, basically what they're doing is making pretty much all of TikTok shoppable, right? And I think one of the things that's really smart about search advertising and this new ad placement is because if you think back a couple of months ago when TikTok shop launched, there was a lot of angst and frustration around the ad loads on TikTok and users were really talking about how they were going to leave the app. That didn't happen. And I don't think people are actually going to follow through on that. But having ads in other surfaces that isn't necessarily right in the middle of the for you feed and interrupting their experience, I think is a really good way to get more advertisers on the app, advertising their products and fueling their commerce business. Yeah. I mean, I definitely have that angst and frustration with the ads. It does feel like TikTok is inundated with things that are ads or feel like ads now, but I am still using the platform way more than I should. So clearly they aren't pushing me off of the platform. TikTok has really good booths at these events also. I have this like deck of cards that I'm holding up that I got from a TikTok booth at Adweek that have like creative codes of different things for me to try as a creator. I'm not a creator. Well, we're in this podcast right now, but I'm not a visual creator, so I haven't used them, but I think they're cute. I have that same deck of cards from Cannes last year, actually. <laughs> I thought it was a game and I was recently uh, delayed at the airport with a friend and I was like, let's play this game. And then it was like, do a dance. And I was like, we're not going to play this game right now. Okay. Because this is the Reimagining Retail podcast, we love tension. We love disagreement. What is something you heard at Shop Talk that you disagreed with or maybe was like overhyped? Jasmine, you go first on this one. So it's not necessarily something I specifically disagree with, but I did get a really interesting question in one of my conversations about what would happen to fit quizzes online, like some, when somebody's answering a few questions to color match yeah. for a beauty product, for example. And the reason I was asked this question was that the person I was speaking to had been getting a lot of questions about whether those are going to die off. And I don't necessarily think that's going to happen. I think there is a lot of value in those quizzes and at least getting people to think about how to select products. But I do think they need to evolve. So I was thinking about my own behavior with these fit quizzes. And a lot of times I'll take one and then I'll end up buying the product I originally intended to buy anyway. 
And that also got me thinking about Snap, who did not have a big presence this year like they did last year. And it's retail AR tools because it's kind of, you know, along the similar lines. And they were really impressive. But obviously, the attention around AR has died down with Gen AI, which, of course, has been a huge topic of conversation here. And Snap has had to sunset a lot of its off-platform AR activities as it's working to recover its ad business. So I, I think there's a lot, you know, of going on in that space, but I don't necessarily think they're they're going to go away. I'm wondering if this is a place where we'll see some creator overlap because I'm getting so much like color analysis content on TikTok right now. Are you getting these where people talk about if someone's like a cool winter or it's the same conversation that's been happening uh, since magazines started, but I'm getting a lot of creator content about that on TikTok and a lot of people engaging through AR filters. My hot take is that I think color analysis is silly and people should just wear whatever colors they want, but maybe that's just because I haven't had my color analysis done properly. Well, I think there is some importance to it, right? I mean, you don't want to wear a foundation that is completely off. So I think it depends on the product. And I agree. I mean, there are creators on TikTok who are specifically dedicated to color analysis. And I actually watch a lot of that too now. Somebody alerted me to it and I can't get enough of it. I think it's fascinating. But I mean, for me, as a millennial and at the age that I am and the amount of time I've been wearing makeup, I already pretty much know what works for my skin tone and what works for me. And so, you know, it's an interesting thing to listen to and learn about, but isn't necessarily going to change my buying behavior. Yeah. And a lot of this I'm talking about is like apparel, like jewel tones and stuff. But yeah, for makeup, also a big creator area. I mean, I also get a lot of creators with darker skin or with uh, skin differences who are talking about different makeup products that they use. So also another area that creators are getting into or have been into, I should say. Zia, what's something that you heard that you disagreed with? I think there are a number of folks here who are extremely bullish on the potential for in-store digital retail media. And I would say that what we're hearing from the retailers may be a little bit more measured on that front. Certainly there are opportunities, but it seems like there's still a degree of caution in terms of how much they're willing to invest in that space. So you know, whether or not this comes to fruition, I think is not under debate. I think that you're going to see quite a lot of activity in that space going forward. I'm just not sure it's going to happen as quickly and to such a great extent as to that which a number of you know the vendors and some of the other folks here are promoting it. What's the reason for the hesitation among retailers? Uh, investment. The fact that they've made investments in a lot of in-store technologies in the past that haven't necessarily panned out. I remember we had launched a whole sort of digital store research area when I was at Forrester. I think it must have been back in around 2010 or something. And even back then, there was caution over investing in these digital in-store technologies. And I think it's the same sort of concern right now is how are we going to maintain these things? How do we ensure that we're going to get that return on the investment? And I think, there again, there will be activity in that space, but maybe there are folks here who are a little bit overambitious in terms of how quickly they think this may happen. I was talking to um, our new analyst, Sarah Marzano, about something tangentially related to this the other day, which is how in-store retail media can and maybe should look a lot more like the store already looks. Like it shouldn't necessarily be something that the consumer notices because if the consumer notices it, that means that the consumer probably feels like there are pop-up ads stopping them from getting their products. So yeah, these like hyper digital formats, a lot of them are really cool, but a lot of them hurt the shopping experience more than help. And so in-store retail media is not going away, but it might happen in more traditional feeling avenues. Yep. And another thing that we're hearing from the retailers is that an additional challenge there is that the store layouts can differ so greatly from one geography to another and one store to another. If you're introducing technology that requires the shopper to be a certain distance away from it, that may not be applicable in all of your stores. Yeah. I mean, in my grocery store in Brooklyn, I can't really fit in the aisle. So I don't think that any uh, <laughs> any big in-store tech is coming there anytime soon. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me and talking Shop Talk with me. Thank you for being here, Zia. Yeah, absolutely. That was fun. And thank you, Jasmine. Thanks for having me. Please give us a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. 
Thank you to our listeners and to Victoria, who edits the podcast and is always willing to talk shop. We'll be back next Wednesday with another episode of Reimagining Retail, an eMarketer podcast. And tomorrow, join Marcus for another episode of the Behind the Numbers Daily. <laughs>